test. Okay. So, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Jakub Domski, uh, and for 10 days I'm in position of Chief Product Officer in SET, so that's pretty new for me. Uh, before I was head of core technology development, which means that my teams were responsible for implementation of uh, most of the security features in SET products, but also uh, they were doing processing of samples, automatic processing of samples, uh, including machine learning. So, uh, uh, I have a question, first of all, to you. So, we know that this is about machine learning, but who of you knows about IT security? So, I will just uh, talk accordingly. Okay. So, not, not that many people. All right. So, let's start. So, what this presentation is about. Uh, talking to uh, machine learning community, when you see adversarials, usually people think about generative adversarial network, so it's not about it. It's about adversarial environment, and uh, about malware detection, of course, and about showing different perspective uh, from academic perspective and from practical perspective, like we do in NASA. And I hope to show you something interesting. Uh, so uh, there's going to be pretty big variety of topics uh, covered here. So uh, something for everybody, I hope. Okay, so let's start with this adversarial environment. What is it? Uh, when you look at the modern machine learning classifiers, for example, or uh, generally machine learning techniques, uh, it's pretty amazing and it works really well. So you have like Facebook deep face for face recognition, so you have self-driving cars. However, uh, uh, there are many corner cases to cover. And uh, the big problem is that reading environment is hard. So for self-driving cars, uh, if uh, road sites are not unified, so for example like here, bridge is out of order, then self-driving car can go through a bridge which is out of order and can go down to the river and people will die, right? So it's nothing really nice. Uh, then we have like police officer um, uh, handling the traffic. It's pretty hard case for uh, any self-driving car and like even recognition that it's a police officer and not road worker working, right? So uh, to have proper and safe uh, machine learning for real environment, sometimes it must be adjusted and be, must be machine learning friendly. However, machine learning in adversarial environment is very opposite because we have intelligent opponent that is trying to fool the machine learning. So if you have Facebook deep face, face recognition, put a mask and it's fooled, right? If you have road signs, cover it and it's fooled. And this is the uh, environment we work with in this. So uh, uh, there are multiple sites involved in this uh, area. So there is academia, there are military or government agencies, we have private sector, and we have, of course, this adversarial site. Uh, academia is focusing a lot on uh, creation of uh, robust classifiers that can handle such kind of environment, but also on attacking it. Example, so uh, a new research from August 2017 um, uh, attempt to fool uh, road recognition with stickers, with spray and things around it. And it looks very effective and it's, let's say, academic approach to it. Military and government agencies. That's an interesting topic because there is a huge, huge investment in this area by DARPA, IARP, and the other agencies. Uh, so the main topic is about creating totally autonomous fighting machines. So this F-35 jet fighter uh, from Lockheed Martin is the last line of uh, human piloted uh, jet fighters they want to produce. The next line will be totally un unmanned. And this drone, on the uh, bottom, it's called like nickname Predator. It's for hunting terrorists, and there are multiple initiatives. For example, from NSA, there is a Skynet program for tracking and hunting terrorists. That's an example of it. So they collect a lot of metadata, they process it, and then they send the drone to kill the person with probability that machine learning is right or not. So, uh, I'm from IT security industry, and in fact, for IT security, it's nothing new. So, the first uh, uh, known article about using machine learning for detection of computer viruses is from 91. 
uh, in ESET, uh, in 98, in NotEyes, there was a small module for detection of microviruses using neural networks, and in years it evolved to uh, what we have right now. Uh, of course, in IT security, if you look at any startup, they use machine learning hype to attract VC investors. And if you put any machine learning to your marketing, it's very easy to get like 100 million of dollars of investment. And there's a lot of companies that do it. Um, so, uh, in IT security, machine learning was used for multiple purposes. Malware classification, spam, uh, exploits, network attacks, user behavior, biometric authentication, fraud detection, and basically anything that was in the past done by humans uh, can be somehow automated by machine learning. Um, and for the adversarial side, uh, when you think about attackers, it's not just cybercrime. So right now we have, for example, Tyler X operations or PL unit from China. So there are spe specialized units. Uh, by, paid by governments to perform cyber attacks. Uh, we have companies that specialize in providing uh, solutions for, let's say, cyber attacks to different governments, like mentioned here. Uh, we have industrial espionage. We have a situation in some countries like China, North Korea, and the others, where governments is not really friendly towards the citizens. And they use a lot of techniques, um, uh, machine learning related to, to uh, track the citizens. And uh, in fact, working against machine learning for such kind of adversaries is nothing new because they do it for years. Uh, okay, let's focus on the malware. So, uh, in case of malware, that's the problem we're facing. So it's supervised learning. We have samples, some are clean, some are malicious, but it's not only about this. We have third class, which is potentially unwanted software, and this class is huge. Uh, 40% of detections of ESET on Windows is related to potentially unwanted applications, 80% on Android platform, for example. So that's a huge, uh, huge area. Uh, and we cannot classify it as a, let's say, hard one malware because of legal reasons. Because those are, are real companies, usually from Israel, that make some deals about putting ads, changing search results, modifying your browser, and doing all the nasty stuff. And you do it basically opt-in, so you install some software, there is a little checkbox that is checked by default and you install this crap, and that's, uh, that's what you have to deal with. Um, we deal with structured problems, because all the IT is created by humans, and all the features usually are extracted from uh, file types, uh, designed by humans. So usually it's not like with pictures where a single pixel means nothing, but every single feature that you extract has some meaning. And uh, malware has multiple forms, so there is no generic uh, file type for malware, because malware can be anything basic. So uh, what can be malware? It can be compiled code for a specific CPU from languages like C++, Pascal, Go, Rust, or whatever. It can be uh, any uh, file with intermediate language. If you use C Sharp, if you use Java, Visual Basic, there is some bytecode which is interpreted, and this bytecode is different, has different meaning than um, just pure machine learning, uh, than, than pure, pure machine uh, code. Then we have interpreted languages like JavaScript, Python, Autoit, VBA macros, and that's again something very different. We have network traffic. That can be uh, interpreted on different levels, from uh, RRP to HTTP protocols. We have basically all the file types that you can imagine. Like there can be exploits in uh, uh, graphic files, PDF files have JavaScript that can be executed. Uh, this presentation can have some macros which can be malicious. Uh, installer files in form of MSI can have installer scripts. Basically, anything can be malicious potentially. And uh, if you want to extract features properly, uh, it's just not very effective and accurate to just use pure bytes. Uh, depending on the file format, we have to create specific parsers, specific tokenizers, and specific extractors of features, uh, that, because otherwise it won't work. What's also interesting and important is that uh, there are non-linear, non-hierarchical dependencies. So there can be offset pointing to some other offset, if some condition is filled. So if you think about bytes and like CNN network to extract the features for you, it won't work. 
to be effective. Okay, so what can be used for features? Basically everything. Okay, pure bytes, that's the basic. You can use strings, opcodes, or tokens, function calls, parameters of calls, uh, execution flow description, uh, file structure, some metadata extracted from the resources. Uh, if you can run the sample, you can extract data from the behavior of it. Uh, if you know about this sample, you can uh, use reputation services, you can look how prevalent this sample is in the world, if uh, it somewhere in the world um, costs some malicious activities, you can look at the reputation of the source from where it was downloaded, uh, basically anything. And extracting such kind of features is not trivial. And then, of course, we have this adversarial side that, that is trying to fool us. So basically they modify the samples in any possible way to avoid detection. Uh, so here on the right, as it's a very simple example. So let's say that you have assignments of constant equal 10 to variable A, and there is infinite number of ways how to do it. And this is how basically machine uh, learning can be pretty easily fooled. Just use uh, junk code, uh, mutate the code, change the flow, split one uh, code into multiple different samples, uh, you can uh, use different API, you can uh, encrypt, encode, basically do anything. And uh, if you just try to use some static extraction features, it will fail. Uh, this problem is well analyzed by academia because uh, uh, of spam. Uh, so by different academic research, if you modify 20 to 40 percent of features in the sample, basically all the classifiers fail because that's a big change for the machine learning. Uh, uh, and if you look at deep learning, there are some interesting researches about it that it's even more vulnerable. So just like 4% of uh, features modified in a sample and deep learning fails. Um, what's interesting, such kind of adversarial samples generalize. So no matter how you retrain the model, uh, they were able to use the same modified sample to be misclassified. And, um, Especially for Google Brain, who is working on this area, it's a very interesting topic because it prevents using deep learning in real uh, life because of those attacks or potential attacks. So uh, there is a Kaggle competition running if you want to join. 17 days left, and you can get free entrance for NIPs for the winner to give a talk about this. Okay, so uh, adversarial modification of features can backfire. So the more they are trying to avoid detection, uh, the more clear it is that it's malicious because clean files do not behave like this. So if they insert junk code, the code is unoptimized. It has different entropy. Uh, it may cause some strange API functions that nobody ever called in clean applications. There can be combination of different system calls that never appear in clean files and so on. Uh, so we use such kind of anomalies as a features itself in the classification. And uh, sometimes the lack of the feature is a feature itself. So if file is not signed by some trusted certificate or any certificates, it's a feature. If it's no UEI, then it's a feature as well. But instead of modifying the features, you can just hide them. If you put a mask on your face, you fool the face recognition, right? So this is exactly what bad guys do with uh, uh, software packers, software compressors, and basically uh, publicly available tools. Some of them are, uh, let's say, simple, but some like this Temida is using really complex techniques. For example, they do uh, code virtualization. So, for example, you have an uh, application running for uh, x86 processor, and they translate this every single instruction into virtual machine, uh, which and this virtual machine is totally random generated for this uh, specific sample. So it, it's really, really complex. And they do it with multi-threading, with self-checks. So basically, any analysis is crazy of this sample. OK, so the question may be, if something is masked, like we have a terrorist, right? Why not detect and block it? We cannot, uh, in many cases, because such kind of packed samples are super popular. For example, games from Ubisoft use variant of VM Protect tool, and basically, if we detect all the VM protected files, we would detect all the games. Uh, if you look at Adobe Power DVD, basically all those known good applications use some kind of protection against reverse engineering. Uh, 
um, um, even big companies like Microsoft provide built-in tools into um, programming uh, workflow to obfuscate the samples. Uh, the reason for it is that modern languages, those um, with bytecode, are bytecode are very easy to reverse engineer. And if you want to hide any information, like license key or some kind of things related to activation of the product, usually they even recommend to obfuscate it. Uh, the other case is uh, that sometimes there is no need even to put a mask. You can just embed some malicious code into clean objects. And uh, of course, the easy way is to use some open source software, modify the source code, and add malicious component and release it. But it's not needed because uh, such kind of modifications can be done even to binary files pretty easily. And uh, uh, the mask and the way to prevent extraction of features is uh, sometimes very obvious, like HTTPS traffic. If the traffic is encrypted, we cannot get the data from, from, from such kind of traffic. Okay, so let's look at the features. Uh, Windows API is big. If you look at the number of exported functions from different DLLs, it's all together about 50,000 of different uh, APIs. If you add to it strings or local context, because like API makes sense only um, if connected to context, so uh, creation or registry file or creation registry key is not malicious itself until it has some very specific value, like disabling firewall, right? So this context is very important. And um, what's needed is to create embeddings in form of engrams or skip grams. And uh, it leads to ultra high di dimensional um, sample set and very sparse data. This is a visualization of, uh, uh, I think, 80,000 of random hidden malware files uh, by multi dimensional scaling. Of course, you know, there are better visualization techniques, but this one was used to show you something. Yeah, so that's course of dimensionality. And uh, with such kind of sets, data is sparse. And space becomes like this. It's spherical hedgehog, uh, which has a few features. So first, uh, objects are very close to the others, or with uh, distance uh, with uh, equal dissimilarity. And the reason is that if you present uh, each uh, sample as a vector, we, where one is one existing feature and zero is non-existing, usually they are full of zeros. So, um, so they are equally dissimilar to, to each other. And it leads to overfitting that with confidence you can classify only samples which are pretty similar. And if you look different representation of this, for example, agglomerated clustering, suddenly you see that there are different clusters and they are pretty well um, distinguishable. Academia is focusing on these uh, 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 detection methods by clustering or by similarity, and they have approach of putting uh, uh, adversarial samples to the training set. But in practice, it's almost not doable because uh, uh, we control the sample sets, and if we see such kind of samples, we can just not put the sample. And attackers in real life do something other, which is basically this resembling pin files or malicious modification of in objects as mentioned before. So uh, how do we deal with this number of samples and uh, dimensions? We said uh, they process about 300, 400,000 of samples and uh, they have this big number of dimensions. So of course it makes little sense to compare apples and oranges. So we first split it by different compiler, uh, file size, version into different subset of samples do different models to classify those specific sample sets. Then we uh, do uh, dimensionality reduction, but not using, uh, let's say, classic methods, because they are too slow. And some methods are not applicable because they create, let's say, a kind of holes in this search space where you just have misses by default. Like with uh, locality sensitive hashing, you have no guarantee that the uh, sample uh, uh, with lower number of dimensions really will be the closest one to, to what you are looking for. Uh, and uh, so we usually do uh, feature selection out of the sample sets. 
Okay, you might have seen some ads, it's for those startup companies that make some big buzz about uh, how great they are. And there are things like, you might not have to update next-gen antivirus for two weeks because they have so strong machine learning model. Well, it's just uh, pure bullshit because in adversarial environments, uh, you have to be very quickly reactive to the changes and to what attacker is doing. So um, this is how it works. So um, adversary is analyzing your classifier, uh, change the attack and uh, release the attack. You have to analyze what was done in case of miss and adapt to it by modifying the model. And basically it's a cat and mouse game with a really constant reaction to it. It has even a name in uh, some academic paper that it's two-person sequential non-comparative stackable burn game of incomplete information. What it basically means that uh, you have some uh, classifier, you have a miss or a false positive, uh, you get the sample, you verify that it's really miss or false positive, you have to rebuild the model and send the update. You know probably that in case of different algorithms, the models can be huge. And uh, if you think about how many users worldwide ESET has, which is right now around 100 million, updating the big, big model every hour would be very inefficient. So uh, ESET uh, implemented uh, some really non-academic non approach to solve this issue. And we do it like this. So um, samples we treat as a vector of features uh, what inform what we call DNA. And those features can be anything uh, what was previously mentioned. So it can be some string, uh, like exists or not. It can be some uh, entropy, it can be some API call, it can be some combination of features, basically anything that can be extracted from, from a specific file type. And we represent it as a kind of um, centroid. We only select some subset of features uh, automatically or manually. Uh, those features can be optional or mandatory and we create some different thresholds for detection. So this is short detection, depending on the basic distance out from the centroid, we put it as a variant, we basically lower the confidence of this detection. And uh, we, providing this detection, we update basically the model in a very incremental way. How well it works? Pretty well. So. If you look at the number of samples, malicious samples that appear in the, in the wild, how we call it, uh, it's exponential growth. So basically every year there is uh, the number of samples gets quite doubled. But if you look at number of our DNA signatures released, it's almost constant. Uh, so, um, okay, it's growing very, very slowly, but we are able to cover those millions of malicious samples with uh, very few detections. And the reason is because our feature engineering is so powerful, basically all the history of ESET is about extraction of features, proper features, high level features, and it's not just using pure bytes. Okay, false positives. So, um, you know that with machine learning you cannot classify everything correctly, and uh, in case of security software, it's very, very important to have close to zero FP rate. And uh, some new vendors are very aggressive with detection. They have good detection, but even up to 25% of false positive rate, which is just crazy and un unusable. And FPs are serious for one re reason, because they break business continuity. Uh, if you have a bank or if you have any like serious business running, you cannot just uh, disable it for 24 hours because it may cause the loss of like hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, every single uh, misclassification, classifying something clean as malicious, leads to this case, basically. Especially if it's kind of uh, Java, Windows file, or whatever, which is existing on really all the computers in the network, it can, can be de devastating. Um, of course, happened to reset a few times. Uh, fortunately, not for Windows files. For example, we had FPs with um, uh, some URL, and we thought, okay, it's looking uh, like really malicious, but it was belonging to some CDN network for some online stores. And of course, it was it led to like global loss of millions of dollars because of just single FP. So we really have to be sure that we are lowering this number of false positives. 
In our processing systems, uh, we have many, many countermeasures to, towards this problem. So we have uh, different whitelisting. So uh, if we know that uh, file is signed by some certificate and we evaluate if this certificate is trusted, then of course we do, don't make detection. If a uh, file is too similar to other clean files, we provide multiple checks to verify if it's really malicious or not. And, uh, we have the whole, uh, let's say, stack of verification before making any detection. Uh, that's pretty interesting. So, uh, positive and negative feedback loop. And uh, if you have a classifier that you train on your own outputs, it leads to that feedback loop. And we really have to avoid this situation because uh, if you put as an input to your system misclassification, it, it, it has potential to affect. One is snowball when this information basically influences the classifier that it's. Uh, Gonna be gonna misclassify more and more because it's learning from own uh, mistakes, or it's smoothing the model. So I can present how it looks like. So we have some trained model, and we use uh, output so those white dots that got classified as a later input. And this is what's happening. I will zoom in. So with each iteration of learning and classification, yeah, it's or smoothing, so really the uh, anomalies object just disappear, or what's worse happening like this, so for example, malware model is spreading, growing, and can lead to uh, this situation. So that's why human verification is crucial in case of our machine learning. Okay, very interesting case is on the right. So assemble uh, equally dissimilar to clean and malware samples. Just new application never seen anywhere. And uh, due to this high dimensionality, it's a very common situation. And somebody has to decide, because machine learning just cannot say with high confidence is it malicious or not. And uh, that's why we have the whole team uh, in what we call virus lab of malware analysts that analyze these kind of samples, where machine learning just cannot decide. And uh, what's important, this labeling of samples is very hard because uh, if you have a big file, like one megabyte, you have to decide if it's malicious or not. So we use different methods, we use uh, sandboxing, we use automated analysis, we collect data from all our users, what the sample did on these computers, we combine it all together in our processing systems and uh, it's really, really hard to do proper labeling of samples in our case. And we have startup companies that just ignore this problem because there are services like VirusTotal where you can submit samples and it was done like for the community. So companies like this have participated with it, with sharing samples. And then uh, suddenly when machine learning got popular, there is a bunch of new startup companies just that just use know-how created by different companies like us. And uh, this is some real case. So. Uh, uh, sometimes malware samples are much more similar to clean files than other version of this clean file. So for example, you have a Chrome in some version, and this is similar to other versions of uh, Chrome. And this is Petya file coder that was just modified, slightly modified version, version of Google Crash Handler file, which is kind of reporting system of crashes from Google software. So, and, um, if you just use similarity for classification, that's how you basically fool all the similarity-based classifier, just modify the sample. Okay, so how we do machine learning in set? So we have this intelligent opponent, and we have to see what he is doing. Because uh, he's, he has access to our software, and he can play with it until some sample is not detected, right? So we must see that he is playing, uh, that's why we send all the samples, all the unseen samples from all the endpoints in the world to ESET. That's a huge data set to process. And um, we do this machine learning in the cloud. And uh, we, after the samples are processed, we distribute this, uh, what we call this DNA model by incremental updates. And uh, also, uh, as soon as sample is labeled by our automated systems or by like guys working, uh, we provide real-time protection to all the endpoints connected to these clouds by uh, just simple hash of the file, but we also use uh, uh, something that we call DNA hash, so we 
make hash of this vector of features, and if they are high level enough, uh, it works pretty well. So if you just extract some API calls, strings, and other other uh, elements as an input, and you hash it, it covers uh, sometimes even 10,000 of, of different executables that were modified on the binary level, because the it's a kind of descri description of behavior of application. So uh, that's our processing pipeline. So we have uh, our products. They are reporting metadata, hashes, files to our cloud that we call LiveGrid. Uh, it goes to submission, file submission storage. Uh, then uh, all the samples are processed uh, by automated analyzers on uh, sandboxed um, machines. So sandbox is um, a virtual or real machine where you execute a sample, you analyze how it behaves, and dump the memory of it, try to extract some different features uh, when it's unpacked in the memory, because samples to be executed on CPU must be unpacked. So at this moment we extract those features, and then we put it all to different or heuristics, machine learning classifiers, or for human detection, and then it goes to our backends, we do this DNA hash blocking, we, um, this information influences our reputation systems, and uh, then goes back to uh, ESET products. So uh, here are the machine learning projects that we currently run in ESET. So we have something called Sisyphus. It's automated classification of different samples. Let's say pretty dummy way, but quite effective of using sandboxes. So basically, if we have a new samples, if it drops something malicious or that has some clearly malicious components, we detect it. Then we have uh, GenCryptic, which is automated DNA detection generation. So um, uh, when you have this vector of features, uh, this system tries to select the best feature to, to cover the sample and to really quickly update uh, the model. We have a project called Augur, uh, which is classification using standard uh, machine learning academic techniques. Uh, we have clustering and classification, we have URL IP reputation system, which is about basically mapping you know, the whole internet like Google is doing. We have file reputation system, and we have something called DNA image for similarity measure. That's the pipeline we have uh, in this Augur. So we have different sample fits. They go to for behavioral analysis into sandboxes. We do this static analysis of files by file type. We extract the features. Then we have set of voting classifiers. Basically, we use everything possible. And depending on the model, we just turn on or on different classifiers. And we have different voting systems. So sometimes we uh, vote for a low number of false positives so if uh, at least one classifier says it's, mal it's malicious then we don't make detection because for example this file is prevalent uh, in the world uh, or we have aggressive uh, classifiers and these files go to virus lab guys to, to really uh, manually analyze and we have also deep learning so um, we do different kind of DNA extraction and that is more suitable for neural networks. Then we have some consolidator neural network and we make detection out of files. So basically set the label and make uh, different detection and provide it. So uh, machine learning inset is combining those academic techniques. Um, we have those different non-academic methods using this DNA model, and humans are still really, really needed for processing of samples that weren't classified automatically, or were classified with too low confidence to, to really create detection. Okay, so that's it. Missed in your presentation, uh, which kind of features do you collect? How many of them do you have? And which type of criteria do you use to select your features? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, we did, uh, as I said, we mostly use feature selection. And we've tried all the available known uh, to humanity algorithms, I think, for feature selection. And what could be surprised? Uh, what worked the best is uh, kind of, let's say, heuristic. So we use uh, from all the sets, clean uh, malware and PVA. Uh, the 
X or N the most uh, popular features. And, uh, and that's it. And we all the most popular features from clean set, from our set, from PVA set into one set of features. And we use those features to uh, as, a, as a feature selection method. And it, in fact, this dummy extraction works much better than any fancy algorithm that we did. Okay, so um, the other question was, uh, what are the features? So, as I said, it depends on the file type. Because if we have uh, JavaScript, for example, uh, it's very different than you extracting features from PE executable files which are compiled. So, um, uh, usually, those features are uh, instructions. So, it can be in the case of compiled files, just opcode uh, or instruction type. We use parameters of this. We use uh, then uh, uh, information uh, about uh, functions or API code. Uh, we use uh, information about strings uh, that appear. We use this contextual information about parameters passed to the uh, uh, to, uh, to to specific function calls. Uh, we use uh, all the metadata available from uh, say header of the file. So if it's executable file, it has a lot of data like uh, uh, information about number of sections, number of imports, number of uh, basically anything that you can extract looking at the specification of P format. And uh, we, in the classification, use, um, uh, we try to always represent it as, uh, as, as much uh, higher level representation as possible uh, of for each file type. So. Um, it really, really depends on the on the on the format that we are extracting the features. Uh, I can just show it. It's fine. Uh, what's the output of uh, of the pipeline? Is it uh, malware, not malware? Or, uh, what's the output basically? It's just so output uh, is in the form of, as I said. Uh, uh, basically uh, voting, so so you uh, get multiple outputs, so depending on the classifier that was used, usually we get uh, just score, uh, sometimes in case of some players we get confidentiality of this, and this consolidator network at the end is basically uh, learning on the uh, how well it behaves and put some weights or uh, put some uh, additional scores to this for for final evaluation. So uh, uh, plus uh, we consolidate also information about behavior from this sandbox analysis. So uh, it's kind of combination and basically yeah. So it's about if it belongs to class of malware to potentially unwanted or clean. Uh, with some score and with some uh, confi right. confidence. Yeah. Okay. I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. So, um, the feature extraction, you mentioned you're doing statical and uh, dynamic ones as well. Um, maybe it's your trade secret, so I don't want to go too deep in this, but um, could you some, somewhat generically say that, that whether the dynamic ones are generated uh, with heaps on the on the client side and whether they were better than the statical ones or like what do you like uh, how do they compare okay so uh, if you think about static analysis so far so you can just look at the file and uh, go you know by some uh, parsing of the file format to extract the features but in the case of for example P executable files that run on Windows, we have uh, something that we call in-product sandboxing, and it's implemented using just a software emulator. And we have emulator for 32 and 64 bits, and we have emulator for, for example, Visual Basic for P code and like the other different uh, emulators depending on the file format. And uh, this uh, is a kind of, let's say, limited uh, virtual machine. So we have implemented subset of operating system with file system, memory management, process management, uh, basic API that is called, that allows us to execute the sample just in the product in totally controlled safe environment to extract, let's say, basic behavioral features. Of course, in, it can be fooled because, uh, like, uh, it's running deterministically, so even simple determini undetermined can uh, cause it to fail. So the question is about like uh, real-time behavioral analysis. 
Okay, so we have this HIPS module that is doing real-time analysis of files and processes running in the system. So the first layer we have implemented, and it works really, really well, is something that we call Advanced Memory Scanner. Uh, it's a real-time memory scanner. So whenever there is any uh, call to the operating system from our product, so file system modification, opening network connection, opening some process for injection of the code, basically any potentially suspicious operation, we check if there are new uh, executable memory pages in the memory, we dump these memory pages and we use some caching to do it uh, like um, all the times or and so on. And uh, we usually at this point in the memory have uh, this unpacked uh, clean code to extract the features from. So, uh, so uh, when we've, at this moment in the memory there is this image like uh, like very nice for extraction of features. So that's that's one thing. Um, then we have um, uh, also heaps and. Uh, we do right now uh, very basic uh, extraction of features, but what's coming to the next version of our products, version 12 right now, is gonna be um, user mode hooking of applications for deep behavioral analysis. So, because right now we have uh, the code running on the kernel level, I, okay, I don't want to go too much into technical details, but I see that some guys are interested. So uh, yeah, so we're gonna extract behavioral features on very granular level that uh, will uh, allow us to create really good behavioral detections, especially for example for ransomware, because that's very loud activity in this operating system. Thank you. And can I have the second question? So uh, could you tell us more about the model you are using? Because you mentioned different kinds of SDMs, neural networks, and so on. Something about the size, number of layers, activations, or type of network, or so. Okay, so uh, uh, depending on the again the file type, there are different models. And uh, for example, uh, we use, as I said, different uh, combination of voting classifiers, and each classifier is auto just to the training set. So there is a kind of pre-processing uh, of optimization of parameters. So uh, basically, we do we extract a subset of this big set. We check what would be the best to uh, match it with, so let's say, uh, initial preprocessing, and it tells us, for example, for random forest, how many trees there's gonna be, how was the depth of it gonna be, and so on. So it's pretty much automated. So it's it's hard to say, um, but uh, when you look how malware authors operate, they don't care that much about those details. So basically, they have your software, they play with it until it's not. Good. So they modify, they introduce more and more changes, and as we submit all the samples to ESET, we sometimes even see that there is sample called ESET one, ESET two, ESET three, ESET four, and ESET five is not detected. And we, yeah, we really sometimes look at the submission sources and just yeah. you know, ban everything that comes from the source or it really goes for some specific s processing system just to over those cases. Okay, so the next question is, uh, do you use other antiviruses as part of classification process? Uh, I would say all the uh, antivirus companies use it because if somebody is telling you it's malicious, it's at least worth to look at, right? So uh, everybody is doing it. Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, our own testing system. We use um, results from, uh, for example, VirusTotal because VirusTotal, if you use it, reports your detections of the others. And it would be just stupid not to use it at, at least as some basic preprocessing, but we don't uh, do automated blocking of what's uh, uh, said by the others, because uh, ESET is always I mean, for these low false, false positives, and some products are just bad with classification, and they classify too many things uh, improperly. Okay. The next question is, how are you deploying your model for real-time scoring? So, as I said, 
uh, to the endpoint, uh, we do not deploy this, let's say, academic machine learning model. So we use those basically uh, centroid-like approach. So we can uh, uh, basically uh, update uh, uh, the model by, by, you know, this model is basically separation in this multidimensional space. And uh, when we put a new sample, which is described by this set of features where some can be uh, mandatory, some can be optional, then there are some specific uh, conditions when uh, they are applicable or not. We separate the space around this centroid in this, uh, in this space. And um, if you combine like hundreds of thousands of such kind of uh, uh, centroids together, it's pretty much model. And it's uh, super effective against malware authors because they work, uh, as I said, so they usually modify just little, the sample, and if you make that's what we call loud detection for this area, but we uh, make uh, sometimes silent detection for much wider area above it, so we, we can very quickly receive the sample that was a miss and react, uh, let's say, in a just minute. Uh, for for detection, it's this cat and mouse game because as soon as your product is available, it will be very fast. So uh, in uh, this adversarial environment, uh, unfortunately, you have to be pretty reactive. And uh, if you want to really prevent malware, then well, it's different, very strict, hard to use operating systems, and maybe you will be safe until exploited in some other way. So. Uh, yeah, and deploying models for in the cloud, we do it just by switching the model when it's generated the new one. Okay, so what are the main cyber threats and challenges on implementing uh, machine learning? So, uh, for challenges, I would say um, this misclassification is super important because it's super easy just to use the scikit learn, deploy some model or basic extracted features. It works perfectly, it catches 99% of malware, but with 25% of false positive rate, or even 5% false positive rate is just unacceptable for any environment. So, this dealing with false positives is a huge uh, issue. And uh, about cyber threats in general, uh, as always, target. That's, that's something uh, to really deal with and requires just different techniques than uh, like anomaly, more like anomaly detection. But you know, with anomaly detection, everything unknown is suspicious and there's infinite number almost of software um, packages. Okay, what is your tool stack? Yeah, so we use uh, usually, depending on the project, we have a lot of custom things for example, for this uh, large scale similarity matching, we have custom system. Uh, for uh, scikit-learn, uh, we use scikit-learn in this, let's say, academic things. Uh, we use TensorFlow for this deep learning. Uh, Spark, for example, is used in uh, URL reputation system. So basically, depending on the projects, we have different uh, tools. So, uh, are whitelists for FP uh, avoidance created manually? Uh, uh, yes and no. So, uh, of course, there is some manual work, but we have systems that basically depend on the prevalence of samples. So, if we see that uh, some sample is prevalent and it's signed by a specific uh, certificate, uh, and we uh, find out that this file never in the world did anything malicious, uh, and there was no injection to this process and like different conditions, then we can say that this certificate with very high probability is clean. And we can do a big whitelisting of files by certificates. And uh, right now, like 80% of files that you have on your computers is um, uh, signed, and uh, out of this 80%, 95 has a trusted by its certificate. So prevalent enough, never did anything bad, and so on. So, uh, so with that, that's the base. And, late, and then we have also different methods, like the base on similarity and prevalence and different factors that we use. But 
Uh, with whitelisting, uh, whitelisting is super important for performance uh, of the system. So if you can whitelist something, uh, you don't need you don't need to extract the features, run it in the sandbox. So basically, it's very very important to have it uh, done well. And yeah, so we do it a lot. Yes, so uh, uh, are there uh, uh, languages, so basically to prove by formal logic that piece of code is safe? There are attempts for it, but uh, uh, it's pretty hard, I would say. Uh, for example, uh, as I said, um, uh, uh, there are even proofs, math proofs, that uh, you cannot say for sure if sample is correct or not. Because, uh, uh, for example, halting problem exists, right? So you cannot, uh, so it's an undecidable problem. Uh, then, uh, it's not, about, not only about halting problem, but uh, uh, samples get updated. They are connected to basically infinite memory, which is internet. And so, uh, to prove that uh, sample is correct, you would need to have uh, it totally static. But as soon as there is any connection uh, from computer where it executes to the internet, you cannot be sure that what initially was a sample, it's still a sample, because it might be updated, it might be exploited, it can be modified one time. And, uh, and that's the test. It doesn't work. Okay, so I will... There is no... So, uh, um, if you look at the uh, general idea, so if you have, for example, planes or uh, if you have uh, spaceships, so it would be really nice to have math proof that the sample is correct, that it's not causing any issues, that it's working as expected. But then we have developers who would have to work with this kind of environment. And uh, even now, just development is hard, it's very complex, and when you look at number of uh, code lines in uh, the uh, stuff that was sent to Mars, it's huge. So while there are academic approaches to, to do it, I doubt in near future it will be used. How are the features extracted for ML classifier different from features uh, for classic pre-ML classifier? They are not different. Okay, so uh, uh, in many, in, uh, let's say 90% of cases, they are not different, but we extract some features, especially for machine learning, that uh, humans cannot work with. So, for example, flow description. It's something that is kind of a binary representation of the graph, of the call graph in the executables, and humans just cannot make good de detections based on it. Like uh, extraction of uh, opcodes information. So if there are some uh, strange combination of opcodes uh, as processor executes them, uh, it's just too big number to be done and processed by humans. So uh, we have some very specific things extracted from files, but depending on the file type, basically. Okay, so what are required changes in the current IT structure? So, um, ESET has quite a big number of servers and we are investing into it highly. So, um, and we are already doing this machine learning. So, uh, uh, not that much. Uh, big change at like a year ago or two years ago was when we started to put graphic cards for deep learning before it, it wasn't there. And uh, yeah, it was costly at the time, but now it's getting cheaper and cheaper with the new line of graphic cards. So, uh, of course, databases, that's a huge issue. So, depending on what kind of machine learning you do, for example, of course, we use Hadoop for storage, and uh, right now guys are playing with different database systems, uh, but right now just playing with those graph-based databases, and, we cons and they consider it may help in some cases, for example, for similar matching or this maybe even URL system in the, in the future, but it's just experiments right now, so we'll see how it will evolve.
you have spec ops to exploit your own software. Yes, so since June we formed something called Security Audit Team and we have guys working on basically attacking our own software. Uh, so first of all we do a lot of fuzzing, uh, so to, for, to automatically find some bugs. We do uh, uh, source code analysis, we do black box text testing, we test uh, the code, we test the APIs, we test the kernel drivers by, let's say, on IOCTL level, if you know what is it. Uh, we do testing of uh, network drivers by, again, fuzzing or, and sending some fuzz data to us, and yeah, so we do it right now. You have your own cloud or are using third party. Uh, so, majority of what we have is in-house. Uh, because, uh, yeah, so those uh, Amazon Azure are nice, but if you look uh, at it from the cost and use it 24-7, it's getting quite expensive. And uh, the reason is that we use a lot of processing power. And uh, so basically it's constant use to the maximum. And uh, yeah, so, so we built it in-house and uh, average estimation was that it's two to three times cheaper than using, for example, Amazon. So, so we, we use it like this. But of course, some systems run in, uh, in Azure or in uh, AWS. Uh, so, sorry, is, is it somehow specialized uh, in comparison with Amazon? Uh, I'm curious why it's two or three times cheaper. Uh, well, because renting uh, at these conditions that we use uh, was just estimated to be to be just too expensive. So because of the constant. Uh... Yeah, it's totally constant uh, load on one hundred percent, basically of everything that's available. We can use it to the maximum because we would just get results faster, and that's what's important for us. If you have detection, if you need to provide detection, React we build the model, so it must be done as quickly as possible. So. We just could use anything, and with this load, it was measured to be just too expensive. And, and, and another question is it uh, comparatively uh, how much uh, reliability is this solution uh, in comparison to the other? So, uh, I would say it's always a balance uh, because, uh, yeah, we had some issues with it. So, we had some data losses, we had some problems. But still, uh, it's good enough. Uh, so let's say it's working uh, 362 days per year properly, right? So it's uh, just balance. And uh, even in case of those problems, we had different techniques. So our company is not 100% machine learning based. We always have different ways to, uh, to do things. And yeah, yeah, so it's trade-off plus uh, usually we have kind of distributed systems. So if one system is down, some others can take over this processing power. What is the ratio between ML classified samples and sample pass for, for the manual analysis? Uh, I don't know right now because it's not my department who is doing this uh, manual analysis. So uh, no idea. Do you think malware authors could start using machine learning techniques to more efficiently? Um, good question. I was thinking about it, uh, and I think it's uh, maybe not uh, first, not needed, uh, because uh, um, they try to uh, they can automate it in uh, let's say uh, programmer's way. So just uh, writing a testing environment that will modify the samples test it against us and so on. And uh, I assume that somebody really smart could do it. For example, trying to find our weaknesses in some automated way. And uh, there were attempts like this by even some academia to do it, but they selected, for example, JavaScript. Uh, and uh, for JavaScript, uh, uh, we didn't use at the time machine learning, so they claimed, uh, those products sucks because they don't do anything fancy there, but they selected very, very specific area, file type, that we didn't have covered with automated systems, right? So, um, so uh, 
Uh, ima let's imagine, uh, for example, this sample creation. If malware can be created in an automated way, so uh, it must still fulfill the purpose. So if it's a kind of bank stealer that is stealing some credit card data, it always must do it. And automated creation of software with machine learning, it's still very experimental in the field of machine learning because if even code that will, for 100 person sure, work correctly by some machine learning algorithm, it's hard. And, uh, and there are just cheaper methods, because malware authors just need to optimize their costs so they use the cheapest uh, thing which are possible, and that would be kind of uh, expensive, would require really guys with knowledge and they're expensive, so be not. Okay, but returning to maybe again to this question. So there was uh, on the last, uh, uh, I think it was on DEF CON uh, last year, there was a DARPA Cyber Challenge. So DARPA sponsored one uh, interesting challenge about automated hacking system. And uh, they expected that guys will use machine learning for it. So basically it was about finding automatically vulnerabilities in network software. Uh, however, all the winners were just bots written like hand coded. So uh, they kind of resigned to do it this year because they realized that still like humans are better for this automated attacking than, than machine learning. Is there a performance cost on client side using ML model? Uh, okay, so um, this model that we deploy. It's super easy to match because it's uh, kind of similar to just going by decision trees. So it's 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 very cheap. Uh, like the most performance cost is on extraction of features, and so we were doing it even before using machine learning. So we started to use machine learning uh, around, let's say, with some experiments 2005, and then 2008 was some bigger, uh, more automation. But just those uh, academic machine learning systems were implemented just uh, last year. So uh, we were extracting all the, all the features that we use right now for years. And uh, so it wasn't a problem for us. So do you train model in real time or in batch? In batch. So we don't use any incremental uh, machine learning, we just use batches and when it's trained we replace the model to new one. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm, I'll stay here for maybe one hour or more, so just you can catch me. Thank you Jacob, and if you have any more questions, you can catch him uh, right now after the presentation and when we are done, uh, and I don't mean specifically like catch, but you can talk to him and ask any more questions that you, do, you would like. Um, in the end, I would like to have some uh, final word. to show you a few more events coming up in the vicinity or here. I'll do a little bit of advertising. So as I already said, uh, you will have a great talk in Brno on 26th of uh, September. So if you're interested in uh, evolutionary computation, take a look and uh, take a trip to Brno. It will be great, I believe. Uh, then I was told that uh, in Prague it's uh, going to happen Startup Weekend Prague uh, aimed on education and um, I got in touch with the organizers and if anyone would like to participate we were given a discount code. We love our algorithms so if you're interested check them out on um, Facebook page or Google them and you can join with, uh, with a discount. Then, next machine learning meetup in Bratislava is going to be in uh, October by Martin Buenak. He's also around here, already there. So he's going to give a talk on uh, some 3 modeling in a month. So I believe we will see all of you here then. And then I was also in touch with some uh, 
gentleman from Deep Learning Meetups in Vienna who advertised me their uh, upcoming meetup in on October 24th with um, um, with very interesting uh, Yufeng Guo uh, guest and uh, I think this is also very close and very available to all of you to have go look um, on this interesting talk. So. This is what's going to happen here in a month. I'll take a look at our uh, details in the program. You can register by Unibrain, and we already have a Facebook page, so you can also like us there to learn about upcoming events and anything that's new in machine learning meetups. So I will not hold you anymore. You can visit our bar, have some refreshments, and uh, talk a little bit more with Jakob. Thank you for a great presentation. It was our pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much.